Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. We are 45 days away from uh, what I believe may be a very significant day in prophetic history. But first I want to talk about these hurricanes. Stronger hurricanes are becoming more common in a warmer climate. Researchers suggest that the most damaging U.S. hurricanes are three times more frequent than 100 years ago and that the proportion of major hurricanes category three or above in the Atlantic Ocean has doubled since 1980. 1980. There were nine hurricanes in 2017, right after, shortly after we began this ministry. 21 so far this year. I want to run through the names of these and what they mean without mentioning the names, just the meanings. Noble, pale green, precious stone, bearing Christ or follower of Christ, busy, earnest, serious, free, victorious or fertilized pasture, torch, light, one who rejoices, uh, another that just means rejoice, and believe it or not, church and assembly, garden of holies, shower, showerer of blessings, hope, champion warrior, noble, God has healed, priceless one, God has favored me, healthy, strong, brave, and a shield or protect. Sounds like I'm reading the Bible is what it sounds like to me. Now concerning our timeline that begins November 27, 28, 29, that three day period right there, it was on that date, on November 29, the UN Partition of Palestine, 1947. Okay, it was also on that date in 1948, the official flag of Israel was unveiled. Okay, it was also on the date that Hanukkah really got started. The temple cleansed and rededicated 164 BC. Israel will be 77 years old from 1947 to now. 2024 makes seven years from the Revelation 12 sign. A 2024 rapture equals would equal a second coming in late 2031 or 2032. That would be 2,000 years from 31 or 32 AD, around the year of the Passover, the, the crucifixion. Israel would be 80 at the midpoint. That fits Psalm 90 verse 10. So the kingdom then would begin, according to the math, on the day commemorating the death of a king, King Herod, the one who tried to murder the king of the kings, king of kings, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? Also, all the dates along this timeline of ours have something to do with the temple. The temple, which today is none other than Christ in the church. I want to read 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Okay, we have this scripture to confirm 480 years earlier the 967 B.C. brings us to an Exodus date of 1447 uh, or 1446 B.C. Now when you subtract the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Joshua 5.6, that brings us to an entry into Canaan around 1407, 1406 B.C. Okay, 1406 to 2024, you're looking at 70 Jubilees. 2024 marks exactly 70 Jubilees since Joshua entered Canaan. 
and most scholars today agree that this occurred in 1406 or 7 BC. The sacrifice is taken away by Nebuchadnezzar, 598 BC. If you add 1290 years, you come to 692 AD, and we've got the Al Aqsa Mosque, Dome of the Rock, which now sits on the Temple Mount. If you forward 1335 years, brings you to a 2028 20, midpoint. The decree to rebuild Jerusalem, 1535 AD plus 40, 490 years, equals this year, 2024. And then we've got the fig tree, generation, 80 years, 1948, 2028, Israel is 80. Okay, you minus that tribulation period, it brings you to today. Okay? I'm not saying what anything is going to happen. I'm just giving you those facts, and you can decide, you know, what you think about this. It's, to me, I can't help but see it as prophetically significant because of the numbers. Because of the numbers. Now, now, you know, there are odd, other odd things like the prophecy of the popes, uh, St. Malachi, maybe you're familiar with that, the, and the 111th pope, uh, you know, there's going to, the 112th will, will mean the apocalypse, and, and, uh, and they say tw that adds up to 2027, that's, that's uh, neither here nor there, but uh, now I was asked, I was asked to tell you folks, since uh, we are this close uh, to the rapture, and uh, which would probably mean the, spell the end of this ministry, at least from our perspective, just who am I? Who am I? You know, you never talk about you, you know. Uh, actually, that's not true. I, I fully 100% believe that this has never been about me. It's never been about me. It's never been about my horse. It's never been about my wife. It's never been about my life in general. Okay, the, the, the focus is not on me. But when I'm asked the question, what is a Christian? Uh, or I'm asked, who am I? You're basically asking me the same question. So I'm going to tell you who I am. Uh, for those of you who are in, interested in, in knowing who I am, I'm going to tell you who I am, and I hope you're not disappointed by the answer. Uh, I think what you will discover as you listen to me in this short little diatribe that I'm trying to formulate in my head without a, any script or anything else is that it, you won't find it uh, dissimilar from what I preach every Sunday. So in describing who I am, I'm basically describing the ministry. Now, we need a beginning point in this conversation. If you're going to ask me who I am, the first thing I'm going to tell you is, and I think this is crucially important in all of our thinking as Christians, I think that we, we first have to determine where it was we began our new life in Christ. I'm going to suggest to you folks something that's uh, really a little different than what I've been suggesting for the past eight years or so. That is, I didn't choose my life. I didn't, I didn't ask to do this. I, I, didn't, I did not plan my life this way, okay? Uh, this is not the life that I chose for myself. Now, I am absolutely thrilled that I was given this life. But what you need to understand, folks, is you are no different than me. I'm no different than you. We did not choose this life. If you are a Christian and you're hearing this message, you did not decide to become a Christian. You didn't make that, that de determination. You did not determine your fate. You did not willfully decide that you were going to become 
your father's child. Now, if you if you want to disagree with this, right, and just click off of this video, that's fine. That's fine. But I'm I'm gonna I want I want you need to listen to me. You need to understand something here. Okay. I would not want to be a Christian. Uh, not that I would have any choice, I guess, but I, I, I would not want to be a child of God if, if it was determined that I go through my entire life giving myself for the credit of becoming one. I, I, I don't I don't want to be a Christian. I, that's not and thank God for that because that is not Christianity. That is not anywhere close to what Christianity is about. Every single one of our lives in Christ began began with God. It didn't begin with us. We were chosen if you if you're asking me who I am, I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm I'm someone who by God's grace alone was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That is a promise that will occur. There's no question about it. My sins have been fully forgiven completely, not just past but present and future. Sin is no longer an issue between me and God because I have been reconciled to God. I did not go looking for Jesus Christ. I did not find Jesus. I did not find Jesus Christ. He found me. Folks, we've turned it around backwards, or Satan has. And if you... If you're not aware of what I'm trying to explain to you, you are one who's, who's caught in that trap of living your life in Christ, believing of all things. It, it, it sort of boggles my mind here, okay? Believing that your life in Christ began, began with you. That, you know, as if... God is is some gray-haired grandpa kind of guy, you know, sitting on on a in a throne, resting on some cloud in heaven. And he's looking down on me, and and he's just he's just chomping at the bit for me to accept his son Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He's just biting his nail. He's hoping that I will. Folks, this is a God who is that idea, that view of a God, of, of your guy, if that's your view of God, that's a God that is completely out of control, who, who has left, left it up, the, the future of humanity up to fallen humanity. Our God is supremely sovereign. I know a God who, he's my heavenly father. He loves me with an undying love. He, he knows the paths that I take when he's tested me. He says, I shall come forth as gold. He settled the sin issue forever, cast my sins as far as the east is from the west, buried them in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. Sin is no longer an issue. In fact, the first command given me in Romans 6, 11 is to reckon myself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How can I do that? By recognizing that I have an old man who can do nothing but sin and a new man who cannot sin because he's been born of God. Because his seed abides in us and, and he cannot sin. The new man cannot sin. We've been sanctified, set apart. We've been made righteous. We've been given access to God. We've been made holy, acceptable, uh, there's no blame. There's no condemnation. Romans 8, 1, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there never is. There's no guilt. We've buried the guilt. We live with sin. We just don't live in it. There's not a Christian alive 
who doesn't know what I'm talking about when I say that we have this old, ugly nature that is can be worse than, well, worse than my horse when I, he doesn't get fed. Dearly beloved, God loves you, and so do we. I have dedicated my life. I have dedicated my life. You want, are you, do you want me to tell you that I, some, well, I, I don't know how, how would I describe my life outside of Christ. I hardly know how. Uh, some, uh, you know, some, uh, some old ragtime, retired, kind of sort of half broke, broken down, half busted up, the other half busted up, old cowboy from uh, nowhere, southeastern Oklahoma. Uh, but I decided I was going to dedicate my life to this ministry called Blessed Hope Forever. Well, first of all, I thought we was going to be gone at, uh, just about a year after I began the ministry. So I, you, you know, I, folks, I didn't do this. I did not determine the course of my life. Not, not now, not the past eight years, nor in the, in the past 68 years have I ever made one decision that determined the course of my life. It was laid out by God. This is biblical. You don't have to believe it. It sure does help a whole lot to do that because a, to believe that we, have a, we serve and worship a God that is out of control, whose who's ultimate plan for all of, all of creation ultimately really depends on, I mean, the outcome of it depends on us. Folks, we didn't do anything to begin it. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He, we, did not, we did nothing to start it. We'll do nothing to finish it. Our redemption is secure in Christ. If you are a Christian today and you are listening to me, you need to understand. Dearly beloved, you need to understand. This is not about how you live your life, okay? It's not about how often you go to church. It's not about whether you, you know, can sing well or not or play the guitar well or not or preach well or not. I'm, I'm a living testimony to that. It is not about you. It's not about your life. It's not about human performance. It's not about earning brownie points with God. It's not about appeasing some angry God to try to make up for some rotten thing that you did in the past. It's not about you at all. You are the loving recipient of grace given by your heavenly Father who had your steps planned out before time ever began. Now, if you want to call that fatalism, go right ahead. I, you know, I don't. I don't call it that. I call it, I call it so God is supremely sovereign, and what He has willed shall come to pass. And there's nothing that we can do to change it. We are going to find ourselves in, in this thing we call human history here. We're going to find ourselves in one place or another. Okay, if we are God's children, okay, we are going to find ourselves in a place of obedience or disobedience. And most most Christians I know would would not even dare suggest that there's anything wrong with us being obedient, obedient to the word. Where the confusion comes in is is, is law versus grace. We are not under law. You can't use the word obedience to, re, to infer that we are to obey some uh, set of regulations, some laws, some principles that lead to godly uh, life or transformation or, or being conformed to His image or His likeness. You cannot mix the uh, apples and oranges here, okay? I believe that I am not, I'm dead to the law, that I might live unto God. That's what the Word says. And, and if I live my life, I'm convinced fully, if I live my life according to the truth of that book, that I am being obedient to the Word. I'm being obedient. Okay? If you think that obedience is all about keeping the law and cleaning up the flesh and cleaning up the old man, then, folks, I got some good news for you. All right, you can stop doing that. You can stop, just stop. And 
and rest in Him. Rest in Him. Dearly beloved, we have been made the very righteousness of God in Christ. The new man is fully righteous. You could not, by your efforts, ever become any more pleasing to God. There's only one person that the Father ever said that He was pleased with, and that is with His Son. This, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> the reason He's pleased with you is because He's, he's been pro propitiated. The reason that He's pleased with you is because you've been accepted in the Beloved. The reason that He's pleased with you is because He has nothing to do with your old man. He is not expecting something from the filth that He's delivering you from. When God looks at you, He looks at you as a saint. We're called saints. Every, almost every epistle, Paul opens it addressing the saints of Christ Jesus. You're a saint. Why is it that Christians don't live like saints today? Why? Why is that? Well, because folks, just to be honest with you, we've been bamboozled by a religious system that believes that only, the, you know, oh, are you, Steve, are you telling me that uh, God doesn't appreciate those who try harder? Dearly beloved, the problem is not understanding grace. Grace is unmerited favor. You were given life, new life, born again, born from above, all by the grace of God, and He called you through the Word of God, and we are to walk worthy of the calling wherewith we were called. We're not under law. We're under grace. It has been the desire of this ministry ever since it began to do basically two things. And that is to be a watchman, a faithful watchman on the wall, to watch world events, to collect data on that. And boy, have we, like two terabytes or something like that. I, I can't even find my old notes from the past. It's just been eight years. A lot, so much has happened. And, and we, we tend to become a little complacent. You know, and it seems like, especially it, the closer that we move to this critical you know, where it's, you know, critical mass, you know, point in history, in all of human history, which is going to be a, a you know, the rapture. Keep in mind the rapture is, a, is an event that's going to turn the world completely upside down. We are the only temple of God presently alive on earth today. All right? It's not, it's not a physical temple. We are the temple. You know, Christians love talking about the third temple and, the, you know, and the, the destruction of the you know first and second temples and the you know and you know not even your body is a temple you are a member of the one one temple which is Christ we are mem we are all members of his body the church which make up the temple we're not a bunch of little temples running around we're not under law we don't have to clean up the old man. The flesh profits nothing. God accepts nothing from the flesh. Nothing at all. If you're trying to please God in the flesh, you're wasting your time. Doesn't it make, shouldn't it, doesn't it make sense to you, folks? Listen to me. Doesn't it make sense that you can't improve upon something that's perfect? Do you think that God begats children who are imperfect? All right, uh, this is what man has, has done, um, you know, the fall. This was the result of the fall. Totally depraved. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, okay? The world. God was propitiated because he, His demand for justice included every sin, every person ever born, committed or would commit clean sl clean slate christ died and removed adam's transgression this is why children go to heaven but when when that child of mine grows up to you know there's i i wouldn't call it an age of accountability like okay well it's 12 steve steve it's got, that's 12 years old you know kid know, ought to know you know what's right and wrong by now you know I don't I don't know what that age is 
We weren't told what that age is, but there is a time in which the law comes in and finds us out as sinners. I was alive once apart from the law, says Paul, but when, but when the law came in, sin revived and I died. I died. And so I can't blame Adam for my going to hell. When the law came in, sin revived and he died. Paul died. If Paul had died as a child, if he had died when he was present in, at Stephen's stoning, which he condoned, if he had died on his way to, to kill Christians, he would have gone to heaven. I know that sounds crazy to say that, but, but he was always, he was set apart from his mother's womb. He, was, he always belonged to God. Now, he didn't know that, and you didn't know that, and I didn't know that, but there came a time in our lives in which God intervened in our lives, and he made real in our lives by in experience, we, he came, we came to realize in experience what was already true of us in, in reality, as far as reality is concerned. We were born crucified, you and I. We were born crucified with Christ. We died, we died, we died with Him, we were buried with Him, raised with Him. All for what? To walk in newness of life. What is that newness of life? Is that cleaning up the flesh? No. Walking in newness of life is walking in His life, what Christ did, not what we do. It's His life, not I, but Christ. We're, 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 we're in the book of Galatians on Sunday. I invite you all to join us there. It's been a great study. I've enjoyed it along with you. When people ask me, Steve, you know, who, who are you? I mean, what? I can go down a long, long list. I, I can probably occupy your time all day telling you what God has done for me. And, and when I do that, I'm telling you who I am. Because everything outside of that is going to fade away. But God love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.